So today, um, we're, we're just going to look at the whole area of Passover and uh, what, what it means for us as New Testament. You know, one of the things that happened in, you know, when Passover was introduced, that one of the things they had to do is they had to have it in haste. They had to be dressed, ready to leave. And uh, the Passover is a celebration of redemption and release from captivity. And the message of Passover, for those of you who don't really understand Passover, is that we've been redeemed by the blood of the land out, out of the hand of the enemy. And, you know, Passover isn't just for Jews. The early church actually celebrated Passover for several hundred years until the Synod of Whitby in, in England. I know it's nothing to do with us as a family, but it's interesting. In 664 BC or, or AD, the king of Northumbria in England ruled that the kingdom would, ca would calculate Easter according to the customs of Rome rather than the customs practiced, practiced by the, the Celtic or the Celtic saints. You know, the Celts were, were a powerful group within the UK. They, they practiced real pure religion. They, they were very spiritual, intensely personal, dedicated to the absolute word of God. And Rome came along and they were very materialistic, very tightly organized and widely social in their intent. And they were very intolerant. And what happened is, is um, Rome basically set up a, a boundary and, and England fell for that. So it was pretty interesting. It's one, it's, this one event's actually been called the death of Celtic Christianity, but that's for another time, you know. We'll talk about that some other time later. You know, Passover is the beginning of God's first cycle of feasts, and it's the foundation for advancing your destiny in God. And to understand Passover, we must remember that Israel was living under terrible oppression, you know, the, in Egypt, Pharaoh was a cruel tyrant. He was, he was taking advantage of these, these poor Israelis and he was working them to death. Their children were being murdered and their situation seemed hopeless and they couldn't see a way out. But then God sent Moses. He began telling them of the good things that God had for them. He told them about the promised land, the land of milk and honey, and it seemed too good to be true for them. But God had a way for them from there. And the starting point was Passover. That was the starting point of moving into the promise of God. Just as God had promised an inheritance, he's promised for each one of us this morning that we can live in victory and we can overcome. Amen? Amen. We are called to be victorious. You know, friends, there's, seven, there's over 7,000 promises in this book that are yours. Over 7,000 promises that tell you who you are in Christ, that you can live as a victor in him. Promises for joy, for healing, to overcome what the Lord has for each one of us. And, and Passover speaks of a time like that. Yet many struggle to walk in their promise, in their inheritance. And you know, much of the Old Testament, of course, is written as a type and a shadow of what God values. And the Jews were to recite the promises of God each season to their children. That's what the Word of God tells them to do. It showed them that they were different, a chosen people. The festivals of the Old Testament were remembrances of things that the Spirit of God had done. And it's really important, you know, often in the New Testament church, we forget about the things that God has done, but the Jews were constantly rehearsing what the Lord has done for us. You know, every time you see the Jews, if you go up to Balaclava or around that part of the world today, you'll see them when they gather on the Sabbath, they walk, they often park their cars around the corner, so it looks like they walk the whole way, but doesn't matter. They, they're kind of saying to the world, we're different. We belong to God. You know, they're wearing the little skull cap or they've got the long, the long hair and all the different things. But they're saying to the world, we're different. They're saying to the world, we serve a God that causes us to be different. 
You know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 70, do not think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will be by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. You know, friends, Jesus was the fulfillment of the promised Lamb of God. Isaiah the prophet prophesied in, in chapter 53, verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. You know, Jesus fulfilled the words of the prophet and many others written so many years before and today we're inheritors of the promises of God. Can I tell you a little secret? It's interesting, the Jews don't read that passage. Many Jews have never ever heard of that scripture out of Isaiah and you read it to them, they go, well, that's out of the New Testament, saying, well, actually, no, it's not. It's out of your prophet Isaiah. They've never, they never read that, that in the synagogues because it points to Jesus. In fact, it's probably one of the most powerful passages out of the Word of God for a Jew to hear that this is what the gospel was about. You know, in the New Testament, Jesus said, as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you remember my death. This morning, we're going to do that in a little while. It's a touchstone for the church to remind ourselves we are gathering each week, not for social meetings, not for great pep talk, even though we might have a good pep talk or we might have some nice worship, but it's because of him. When we celebrate communion, that's why he said, do this as often as you meet together. The problem is we mostly forget. We easily forget what God did. We think church is about a social time, but it's not. It's about Jesus. It's about all he, all he did. You know, each of the seven feasts in the Old Testament were instituted by the Lord to remind the people of Israel that they were different, that they were not like other nations. If you understand that they were in this huge um, time where there were so many different nations around about them, but God called them to be unique and to be different. Even today, the Jews look different, a people with God's fingerprint upon their life. I think I told you last week I was in Sydney, we went to a synagogue and we, um, we, we went through all this stuff and he was explaining to us the synagogue, how it all worked. And it's so unique being around Jewish people. They have such a uniqueness about them. They're, they are set apart in that way. The way, you know, it's really interesting if you look at what God has done in history, the way he has restored Israel. It's, it's the only dead nation that has been resurrected in history. A prophetic fulfillment of Isaiah 66, verse 8. Who has ever heard of such a thing? Who has ever seen things like this? Can a country be born in a day? On May 14th, 1948, David Ben-Gurion, the chairman of the Jewish Agency for Palestine, announced the formation of the new state of Israel. Never heard of that a nation can be born in a day. Tremendous opposition, but God fulfilled his prophetic promise. You know, even the Jewish language, Hebrew had fallen into disuse. A Jewish scholar named Eliza ben Yehuda taught Hebrew to his family and he kept the language alive. It was a dead language. He eventually started teaching others and that dead language was resurrected and today it's the official language of Israel. Friends, that's a miracle that God brought back a dead people. He brought back a dead language and he's saying to the world, this is a sign and a wonder that I am on the throne. Everything about Israel's preservation is supernatural. As a nation, it's a timepiece for God. You know, the seven feasts in the Old Testament is a prophetic timeline to the work of God in the earth, the shadow, if you like, of things to come. As with everything God does, his stamp is all over 
these feasts. And I've shared this before, but it's so powerful, you know. There's seven churches, seven spirits, seven stars, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials, seven personages, seven dooms, seven new things, seven symbolizes the spiritual perfection in God. And every time you see this, this pattern in scripture, you're seeing the stamp of heaven and saying, this is my work. This is what I'm doing. You know, all of life revolves around this number. Seven is used over 700 times in the Bible. It's used 54 times in the book of Revelation alone. There are seven days in a week and seven is stamped through the scriptures as God's fingerprint. You know, in the human body, seven is a strong factor. Changes take place in our body every seven years. There's seven bones in our neck. Did you know that? There's seven, hole, seven holes in, in your head. There's seven bones in your ankle. You know, there's seven bones in the face. There's seven notes in the musical style. All other pictures are a variation of these. And seven speaks of perfection. It's amazing, isn't it? It's such a wonderful thing when you understand that God's fingerprint is on so much of life. You know, the seven feasts speak of the perfection of God and his plan that will be fulfilled. Each feast is a layer upon a multiple layer in God, a perfect plan being outworked. You know, we haven't got time to study each of these, but let's look at a scripture out of and a Leviticus this morning, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 1. And this is the Lord speaking to Moses. He said, speak to the Israelites and say to them, these are my appointed feasts, the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. There are six days which you may work, but on the seventh day, it is a Sabbath of rest, a day of, of sacred assembly. You are not to do any work. Wherever you live, it's a Sabbath to the Lord. These are the Lord's appointed feasts, the sacred assemblies you are to proclaim at their appointed times. Now, we haven't got time to unpack all seven of them this morning, but I just want to look for a few moments at the Passover, which is the first of, the, of all the feasts in God. On the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. In, in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 5, it says, in the first month, on the 14th day of the month, the twilight is Passover of the Lord. We've just come through Passover. It's an interesting time in, in the Jewish calendar. And Passover, all over the world, Jews prepared their houses. They prepared their lives and celebrated Passover. It's interesting. This weekend, we've just had another election in, in Israel. And you might have noticed that we still don't have a government in Israel. In fact, for the last three years, we haven't had a proper government in Israel, but God's got a purpose in it all. I don't understand it, but you have to look at that and you go, well, what are you doing, God? Well, I believe he's doing something. And I think he's up to something quite significant, interesting times in which we live. You know, this Passover was fulfilled in Jesus through the Lord's Supper, and it represents for us salvation, the door through which we must enter, the lamb being slain for mankind, the blood being shed that we might have eternal life. And the feast was to remind ourselves, was to remember that God delivered them from death and protected them. Now, the, the name Passover is derived from the Hebrew word Pesach, which, but, which is based on the root Passover, and it refers to the fact that God passed over the first houses of the Jews when he was slaying the firstborn of Egypt during the last of the ten plagues. If you rem remind yourself of that, those ten plagues, and the Israelites were preserved because they put blood on the doorpost. That was the beginning of Passover. It requires the, move, the removal of chametz, which is leave and bread from their homes. And chametz includes anything made from the five major grains, either wheat, rye, barley, oats, or spelt. And they go around their houses with a feather often. We live next door to a Jewish couple and 
I was talking a while back to the woman, the lady, her name's Sue, she's a really lovely lady, but she says, you know, she was brought up every Passover, they would go around the house with a little feather and they would dust out the shelves, dust out the refrigerator with, the, with this one feather, very symbolic. The removal of Chemetz commemorates the fact that the Jews left Egypt in a hurry and it didn't, they didn't have time to let their bread rise. It also symbolic of the fact of removing the arrogance and the pride from our souls. Because, you know, when you think of what, what, is, what does this mean? What, what does bread mean? What, what is the whole understanding of that? It, it, it talks about the puffiness of humanity. The grain product they eat during Passover is a, in place of chemetz is called matzah. Anybody tried matzah? It's awful. <laughs> it's flour and water. That's all they make it out of. It's not allowed to have salt. not allowed to have anything else in it. It's literally these little biscuits that look like salada crackers that taste like nothing much. Matzah is unleavened bread made simply from flour and water. It's cooked very quickly. And it's traditionally viewed as the bread the Jews made for their flight from Egypt. It's also referred to as the bread of affliction. The process of cleaning the homes in, in, for Chemetz in preparation is an enormous task. It, as I said, the Jews spend several days and even weeks scrubbing down their houses, their kitchens, the inside of everything in their homes, covering all surfaces with foil or shelf liner that came in contact with Chemetz during the year. On the night before Passover begins a formal search of the house. This is called Bed, <laughs> Betty Cat Chemetz which searching for the unleavened bread and they'll get a torch and they'll get their little feather and the search is ceremonially go, no, not a torch they used to have a candle these days they use a torch they'd walk around with the candle looking for the last pieces of bread and often part of the entire Passover meal after the search a small paragraph is recited by the Jews to nullify any additional chemets that could not be found. They say, all leaven or anything leaven which is in my possession, which I've neither seen nor removed and about which I am unaware, shall be considered naught and onalist as the dust of the earth. That's a thing they do before they celebrate Passover. They take it so legally. The morning after Passover begins, any remaining chemets in one's possession must be burnt a commandment called Baya Chemetz, which is burning of the leave, leave and bread. Sounds crazy to us, but they so legally do this because it's an understanding there can be no leaven, there can be nothing in your life that will poison you for the new, the new season ahead. Today, many towns establish a community site where large bonfires are created and all the residents come to destroy the chemets together, all the Jews come and burn up the last of their breadcrumbs. And the day before Passover is also a fast day for the firstborn males, commemorating the firstborn Jewish males in Egypt that were not killed during the final plague. You know, Jesus grew, grew up celebrating the Passover every year. The Last Supper that we remind ourselves of is the final meal that in the gospel accounts is, is actually a Passover. Jesus shared with the apostles in Jerusalem before his crucifixion. The ritual was fulfilled the day through him. He was the Paschal Lamb. He was the Passover. John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You know, John had a revelation that this man was the promised lamb. Every year they would take this unblemished lamb and they would sacrifice it in such a, a wonderful way. But Jesus was the fulfillment of that lamb. He was a spotless lamb of God. He came to earth to be that Passover lamb. In Matthew chapter 26, it says, when they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after blessing it, he broke it and he gave it to the disciple. He says, take, eat, this is my body. And when he'd taken a cup and giving thanks, 
He said, he gave it to them and says, drink from it, all of you. You know, today, friends, we are celebrating that we are, have been redeemed. Now, I hope you've all brought your communion. Did everyone get a cup of communion today? Tony, could you do the honours if there's no one got that? But before we do communion, I'm going to invite Sue to come and do something that happens often in Passover, and it's the playing of the trumpet. Or, you know, Sue, Sue's brought her um, shofar, and um, she's going to play the shofar as a, a reminder. Now, there's a special way they do this, so I'm going to let her do that because I have known. Hmm? Okay, Tony, could I get a one as well? Thanks, mate. Good. Yeah, I've got one. Thanks, mate. Amen. Okay, today let's open our communion, take the bread. And Jesus took the bread and after blessing, he broke it and he gave it to the disciples. He says, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. You know, just close your eyes before you take it this morning. Remind yourself of what Jesus went through. Just imagine that the many, many years that the Jews had celebrated this feast, they didn't understand. But Jesus, that day, when he took bread and he broke it, he was fulfilling the promise of heaven. He was walking in, in this prophetic fulfillment that day. And he took that bread and he broke it. And he said, take, eat. This is my body of the new covenant that is, is broken in my blood, or sorry, in my, in, in my name. Let's take it together and eat it. Amen. And after supper, the Bible says he took the cup. And I've said this many times, but, you know, in the, in the Passover, there's, there's quite a number of different cups that are on the table. And this particular cup that Jesus took was the cup of the Messiah. It wasn't just a cup that he had. It, it meant and represented him. And he understood that. The Jews around him understood that. And he reached and took that cup. And he said, this is my blood that is poured out for you. This morning, as we take this little cup, reminding ourselves in this Passover, in this time of communion today, that we have victory through him. Let's take it and drink it together. Amen. Amen. So, Father, we just thank you for sending your son. We thank you this morning that we have such an inheritance with you. We thank you for the blood of the lamb. We thank you, Lord, that your son came and fulfilled all righteousness. Lord, that no longer do we need to sacrifice bulls and goats. We no longer do we need to go through all those things because your son did it once and for all, for all time. I declare this morning at this Passover, Lord, that we are walking into a new season without Father God, the hardship of the former season. We walk as new covenant believers today. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Amen.